Uh, okay, so this is uh, seminar number three in, in a series. They're aimed at graduate seminar uh, at graduate structural engineers, but they are uh, um, suitable for any engineers, really any structural engineers. And the topics we'll discuss um, tonight are quite relevant to all structural engineers, whatever their experience. Some of them uh, from Britain, they're, they're examples from all over the world uh, as well, uh, lessons learned. And the codes and building regulations I'll be quoting um, started with the, the, the British building regulations, but also a touch on Euro codes and um, a, a touch on And we'll touch on New Zealand as well. So we're going to look at some historical structural failures and the lessons we learned from them. Um, once we've gone through those uh, in various themes, we'll then look at the requirements uh, for designing against progressive or disproportionate collapse with reference to the UK and the New Zealand building codes and regulations, also touching on the Euro codes. Uh, and this is another one that grew in the telling. This is not the first time I've told this tale, and the tale grows bigger as we go. So Charlie Brown there is a famous cartoon, and one of his cartoon strips, uh, he was admonished by Lucy for not worrying about his mistakes, because you always learn from your mistakes. And he said, if I did that, then I'd be the smartest person in the world. And just for reference, the list of structural failures, sadly, is very long. Uh, and there's a long list available on Wikipedia. Uh, so just let's look, uh, go onto Wikipedia and look for structural failures and collapses. Um, looking at New Zealand, um, there was a, a series of uh, seminars given a few years ago and some of the common causes raised by building consent authorities and checking engineers of where buildings had gone wrong. Um, so the obvious thing is rusting, not, not taking into account the fact that steel needs protection against pr corrosion uh, and long term durability can be suspect to some um, steel elements. Uh, the obvious one is inadequate quality assurance. Um, things are not being checked uh, and probably still not being checked adequately enough. Uh, standard details being used without critical thought. So we've all got a nice library of standard details uh, for drawings and then we like to cut and paste them in our own designs and our own reports. But you've got to be careful how you're using them because each standard detail should have its own calculation and be careful when you're modifying it, because if you modify it, you need to redesign it as well. Uh, one of the biggest issues is this fee issue of fees. Uh, back in the good old days, it was about seven and a half percent of the project cost would be your fee for your structural engineer. Uh, we're lucky if we get one percent now or the equivalent of one percent. Uh, training and mentoring, always mentioned by the engineering institution institutions. Um, again, Nobody wants to pay for it. Nobody wants to do it. Nobody wants to uh, stump up for the cost of it, except it's desperately needed. So a lot of uh, graduate engineers are left with an own initiative. And yes, as graduate and even senior engineers, you are expected to do um, continuing professional development, of which this seminar is a useful part. In New Zealand, Engineering New Zealand expects you to record at least 40 hours of continuing professional development. Uh, particularly relevant to your uh, profession. Um, in some cases, there was arrogance, you know, a poor attitude uh, that, oh, it will never happen. This has never fallen down before. <laughs> yeah. Um, common, common mistake is lack of site investigation, um, that a major project <clears throat> can fail simply down to not knowing enough about the ground. So a couple of boreholes are not usually enough for a large site. Um, and no site investigation, you're probably heading for trouble anyway. Things to check. So again, this is a checking engineers and um, building uh, consent authorities. 
things that are missed by engineers in their designs that they submit for building consent. So obvious things like the load path. Don't forget bracing. Is it a gap in the bracing? Um, not understanding how the members are restrained, assuming member restraints that aren't there, um, assuming that you've got a diaphragm when you've not got adequate connections to ensure that diaphragm. Uh, don't forget that in some cases, your purling design load, the critical design load, will be for local wind pressures, which can be up to two or three times bigger than the normal wind pressures. We'll come on to wind design in a, form, in a future lecture. Um, don't forget the, the soil type. We often assume a certain soil type around here, possibly a type C. Um, but until you have evidence from a geotechnical engineer of the soil type you use, it is an assumption and be careful how you use it. Has the correct importance level been chosen? Um, now, in New Zealand, we use this uh, importance level what, effectively one to five. Now, a typical shed um, unoccupied would be a level one. An ordinary building would be level two. Uh, slightly more important, for example, a school or a hospital would be level three. Large schools and hospitals will be level four. Um, and the importance level will vary um, depending on the occupation, on the how many people are in it. Another mistake is assuming ductility, but not putting in the details that give you the ductility. Um, designing um, roof members as if they're part of the main structure when they may actually behave like parts. Um, so if you've got a, a multi-storey concrete structure, with a steel framed roof on the top of it, you really should be designing the roof elements as parts, as in chapter eight of 1170. Uh, don't forget eccentricities. Try to avoid them if you can, try to design them out. But if you do have eccentricities, and they can often arise in bracing, then you need to allow for the extra forces that arise from that. Um, concrete walls need to be supported, uh, particularly out of their plane. Uh, and so if there's no support at the top of the wall, you're looking at a cantilever. Ah, this is a big lesson for New Zealand. This is the CTV building in Christchurch. Um, and most of the people, the vast majority of people who were killed in the Christchurch earthquake were killed in this building, one building uh, with the vast majority of deaths. Uh, and if you look at it and look at the drawings, you should be able to see the mistakes in it. Um, there's a good report available on the CSOC website, uh, goes into the collapse of the CTV building. Uh, so that's your first item of homework is your look at this document, read this document. It's worth reading um, as well. There's, there was incompetence and corruption on a colossal scale when building this building. The other thing you need to read, this is the second part of your homework, uh, is this book called Rotnomics by Peter Dyer. Um, so I'd never heard of the, the leaky building syndrome before I came to New Zealand, but was suddenly confronted with it. This skill gives you the full story of it. Uh, and there's a dark period, as they call it, in the uh, construction industry uh, where buildings were not particularly well made. Um, and this tells you the whole story. Again, worth buying the book. It's, it's not very expensive, available. Uh, at your local bookseller, I should think. I bought it online from Fishpond. So a reminder from seminar number one, don't forget we can't actually predict what loads will be applied to our structure, how that structure will respond to those loads, how the materials will behave or perform under those loads. Therefore, we make assumptions. And we use simplified representations or models for analysis and design. So the themes tonight on failure and collapse, what we learn. Well, it's a big one about misunderstanding uh, loading and structural behavior. Um, there's also an issue about the unpredictability of loading. You didn't see it coming or the engineers at the time didn't see this behavior or this type of loading coming. Uh, consequences of changes made to the design during construction. Um, now, contractors like to propose alternative methods of construction, which often 
mean changing the way the building has been designed, which can have disastrous consequences if it's not thought through properly. The inspection regime, all buildings need to be inspected when they're being built. Uh, and the more complicated and the higher risk per building, the more inspection you need. And we'll look at disproportionate and progressive collapse. So the first on the list uh, is in Sheffield in England. Uh, and it was at the beginning of the start of the Industrial Revolution when towns and cities were growing and had a demand for water. They started building dams. Uh, and this was one of them, a Dale Dyke Dam in Sheffield, and it was an earth gravity dam which failed disastrously and flooded the uh, uh, the valley and many people in that valley. So that as a consequence of this failure and several other failures of dams, um, they brought out the Reservoir Act. Um, that was the last, I think, incarnation of it in 1975, but it was in the late 19th century that it was actually put through Parliament. And this required the supervision of a panel engineer, as they call it, so in, in the UK, the only reason you need a license to be an, be an engineer is if you're building dams. Uh, this is a favourite and you can find this video and videos that go with it on YouTube. This is the Tacoma Narrows Bridge in the USA. Um, and it was kind of an unusual design at the time. It's a suspension br bridge, as you can see, but it had quite a thin deck, uh, not particularly aerodynamic deck. And as the wind passed over the deck, you got eddy currents, which were incurred or caused vibration in the deck. So they didn't really think about how slimline decks and slimline structures would behave, because they always assumed before this that um, that bridges were heavy and relied on gravity. Now we're moving up to suspension bridges, they're getting lighter and lighter, and so they can be affected by wind. So they didn't really understand the wind loading at the time or how wind load is dynamic and how it can influence a lightweight structure. So the lesson from that is an aerodynamic deck. So most large bridges uh, are usually um, designed to withstand the, the wind loading on it and it will often be tested in wind tunnels. Uh, to mimic the conditions in, in the real situation. Uh, this is the Humber Bridge in the UK uh, as well. When it was built, it was the longest single span suspension bridge in the world. Um, and a few years later, this one went up. This is the Millennium Bridge in, in London uh, in 2000 to celebrate the turn of millennium. And it links the north and south banks of the River Thames with a footbridge. Uh, and it was a super light, very shallow uh, suspension bridge. And on its opening day, 50,000 people turned up and they all started marching in step, which caused lateral displacement and induced um, harmonic behaviour. Uh, did they predict it? Well, there's an old sign on many old suspension bridges that the army has to break step. Uh, because they understood that people walking or marching in time would induce vibration within a suspension bridge. Um, but this is a slightly different variation of it. This is lateral, it's people moving from side to side. And as the bridge moved, the more the people moved from side to side and in harmony. Uh, and it was amazing to see how quickly it went from being the architect's bridge to being the engineer's bridge. The company that designed it uh, retrofitted it with tuned mass dampers uh, at enormous expense and so it no longer no longer wobbles uh, and isn't anywhere near as much fun but there are similar bridges uh, around the world which you can make uh, vibrate uh, this is Florida a more recent one in 2018 um, and this was the post child for women in engineering I'm sure that had nothing to do with the fact that it collapsed the next day. Um, this was misunderstanding the structural behaviour of this bridge. Again, it was an unusual bridge, uh, pushing the envelope. Most of it was erected off site next to the si final site. It was then erected into position before the cables were attached because it was eventually going to be a cable stayed bridge. <clears throat> so the, the tiny 
strut elements here uh, had load reversal. Back in England, back in 1965, again, this is about loading and behavior under loading. So this is Ferry Bridge cooling towers, uh, again, in the north of England. And um, because we needed energy, we were burning coal to produce electricity and the water or steam was condensed into these things called cooling towers. And as they progressed, they advanced concrete technology to the point where they could make very big structures with very thin walls. Unfortunately, they were rather too thin. Um, they hadn't really taken into consideration, one, the effect each structure has on each other. So when you start grouping tall structures together, the wind is influenced by each other. Uh, the second aspect is that it hits the first row of towers and then you get what's known as a vortex shedding. Uh, and so the uh, circle at the uh, top of the cooling tower starts to um, turn into an oval, as it were, an ellipse and vibrate back and forth, eventually causing it to collapse uh, as well. So many of these had to be retrofitted. But again, it's about understanding the dynamic behavior of structures and the dynamic wind loading. Uh, this is quite close to home, or it was quite close to home to me at the time. Uh, this is Gerard's Cross Tunnel in 2005. Um, and this actually cut off my access to the railway to London. They were building a Tesco's and therefore had a car park. And the, the railway company liked to earn some more money by the space or the air rights over their railways. And so they sold their air rights to Tesco's who built a car park on it. And the car park was a very simple construction. It was precast concrete arches. As you see, uh, mechanically, it's a statically determinate three pinned arch. Now, three pinned arches and arches in general work quite well as long as you load them uniformly. This collapsed because you piled up the load on one side. And then the uh, arch collapsed under the load. Uh, fortunately, nobody was injured in this. The train driver spotted it before and stopped the train. This was an air mist, uh, again, back in New York. Uh, again, an unusual structure. And the reason it was an unusual structure is if you right at the bottom of the picture, you can see this little church here. So the developer bought the block um, and wanted to build a rectangular building as normal to make lots of money. Uh, but they couldn't get permission to buy this little church or the corners of it. So the architect came up with this grand scheme of, well, let's put the columns in board. What's the worst that could happen? Um, and it was built and it was a roaring success until the problem was given to an undergraduate. And this undergraduate was called Diane Hartley, and she was uh, assigned the task of showing how this building worked as a structure. And then she said, I can't make this work. Um, and so she was taken to the original design engineer and he admitted, oh, they look like it's changed it. So what happened is this should have been a fully welded building. So all the connections in this, of all the structure should have been fully welded. Unfortunately, the contractor had a better idea and said, well, let's bolt things together because it's much easier to build bolted structures and welded structures. Um, and so many components were changed to welded structures. That uh, is not as stiff as a welded structure. And so under wind loading, it would move. And under the progressive wind loading, you'd get P delta effect, the second order effects coming in threatening the stability of this structure. The solution was agreed actually to weld up all the connections and that's what they did over the course of a few months. They went in floor by floor and welding up, welded up all the connections. So it just goes to prove if you've got an unsolvable problem, give it to an undergraduate. Uh, this was a terrible tragedy back in 1981. This is Hyatt Regency Walkway um, and one of the uh, sort of biggest structural fatalities around. So 111 deaths at this scene with 219 injuries. Uh, and this was this, this walkway 
uh, which connected two parts of the hotel and it was suspended from the levels above and it was suspended on hangers and the hangers passed through uh, these welded channel sections. But because of that, um, again, this was a change in the um, design to make it easier to build. So what happened was that one component was carrying double the amount of load it should have been uh, as well. And that was that was signed off, but not supervised properly. Ronan Point, this will be familiar to all British engineers. This is a case study uh, that all structural engineers in Britain have to know about. Um, I, fortunately, I would say fortunately, not many people were killed, only four people were killed in this. Uh, this was uh, what was called system building. Uh, so in the 1950s and 1960s, there was a desperate shortage of housing. Um, so the solution was to, to make them from precast concrete and as panels, bring them to site and assemble them together. Unfortunately, they didn't make the connections secure enough. Uh, and this is the problem with precast concrete buildings. Uh, that if you precast the floor and precast the walls, it's very difficult to make those connections robust. <clears throat> the consequences of this was it actually killed the system building method. Uh, nobody wanted to live in one of these high rise blocks and it led to, as I say, a complete loss of public confidence in high rise residential buildings. Uh, and, it, and it led to major changes in the UK building regulations uh, as well. So this is what we call disproportionate collapse because you think something big has happened to this building to cause that amount of damage. But in fact, it was one flat. There was a, uh, I think it was a gas heater. Um, and they shouldn't have had a gas heater, of course, because the thing was all electric. Uh, but because it was poorly insulated, the tenants were cold, so fired up their gas heater and it leaked and it went bang. And the gas explosion blew one of the panels out one of the side panels out uh, because the tying of that side panel to the rest of the structure was inadequate. But as a consequence of that, the panels above it collapsed and then the panels below it collapsed. So it's what they call progressive collapse. One failure in an element causes failures in many other elements. It was also disproportionate because the damage done was out of proportion to the cause. And here we see another disproportionate uh, collapse and a progressive collapse, uh, a bit more dramatic this time. Uh, this is the Murrah building in Oklahoma, <coughs> where, um, where a man who didn't want to pay tax parked a, a, a truck bomb uh, outside the uh, federal office. And it, blew out one of these uh, beams, these uh, which is a, a double span beam because the column comes down mid span uh, of this beam. And as a result of taking out one of these beams, the column above it collapsed and the floors around it collapsed and so on. Um, and so the British engineers looked at this and they said, oh, that's a progressive collapse. And the Americans said, what? Uh, and so a lot of British engineers went over to the US in the uh, late 90s uh, to teach the Americans about progressive collapse and disproportionate collapse and tying buildings together. Um, and they came up with a code that was far more complicated than the British code, but does the same sort of effect, i.e. tie your building together. Ah, World Trade Center, uh, 2001. Um, so yes, that was fairly devastating and it was progressive collapse, but was it disproportionate? Well, apart from the two towers, the two very large towers that collapsed, surrounding buildings collapsed that hadn't been hit, including three World Trade Center, four World Trade Center, six World Trade Center, seven World Trade Center, uh, the Greek Orthodox Church next door. Um, so that's one, two, three, four, five buildings destroyed, as well as the Twin Towers. And then the surrounding buildings were, were also damaged. So five World Trade Center suffered a large fire and partial collapse. Uh, the World Financial Center buildings, 90 West Street, Cedar Street, Verizon building, World Financial Center, three, 90. This is a lot of damage. 
And to me, this seems way out of proportion. Um, this, I would say, is disproportionate comments. Um, yeah, and the Deutsche Bank had to be deconstructed because of the severe damage it incurred. Um, now, oddly enough, World Trade Center is in Manhattan, and Manhattan is basically a lump of rock. Um, and so it's seismically stable, so you wouldn't design it for earthquakes. And any of the buildings around there probably wouldn't have been designed for earthquakes. Um, but the force of a 110 storey building hitting the ground would have been the equivalent of an earthquake in, in Manhattan. And we say, well, did it need to be designed to withstand an aeroplane impact? Well, in fact, it was. Uh, it was designed to withstand the impact of a Boeing 707 flying at either takeoff or landing speed. And fortunately, it wasn't a 707 that hit it, it was a 737, a much bigger plane, and it was at cruising speed with fuel tanks full. And it was the fire that did most of the damage, because um, if you'll notice, it survived the impact of the aircraft. And is it robust? Well, I kid you not, but at the time, 9-11 um, in uh, 2001, I was reading a book about protecting your building against explosives. And one of the case studies is the World Trade Center. Uh, so in 1993, there's a bombing of the North Tower by this little known outfit called Al Qaeda. And they used a rather large bomb, 606 kilograms of urea nitrate, also hydrogen gas enhanced. That's a fairly big bomb. Um, and they parked it in kind of the middle of the building, expecting to bring down the whole building. And the building survived. Two of the floors were knocked out, but they were rebuilt. And what uh, saved it in the first uh, attack was its downfall in the second, because the World Trade Center is a bit unusual, or was unusual, that its lateral stability is provided by its perimeter structure rather than the core structure. Uh -huh, another favorite, uh, this is a uh, interstate highway 31 west um, over the Mississippi. Uh, and there's a, again, a video on YouTube and get of, it, of the thing collapsing. And uh, one of the reasons it's collapsed because it wasn't maintained. And the reason it's not maintained is because the state is responsible for maintaining bridges and major pieces of infrastructure. But the federal government is responsible for replacing failed infrastructure or building new infrastructure. So there's not much incentive uh, to, to maintain your bridges, I would say. But as a result of this, what was this? It was an electro slag uh, welding issue. And uh, traffic authorities around the world and city authorities around the world said, have we got anything similar to that? And in London, we did. Uh, this is the M4 Boston Manor Viaduct in 2012. Now, the M4 is a major route, it's a major road into London, and it happened to be 2012, which was the year of the Olympics. And so a couple of months before the Olympics were due to uh, start, the engineer had to say, I'm sorry, but I'm going to have to close this motorway uh, because they had electro slag welds and they did discover the same weld defects in those welds. And so went back and retrofitted uh, and repaired those uh, and did it all in time for the Olympics. So in a nutshell, You've got to think, well, what's the worst that can happen? Um, and if you're a structural engineer and working on high risk buildings, something in the back of your mind should be asking, well, who's it going to kill? So there's a whole series of uh, disasters in history you can look through, uh, see if you can spot them. This is Piper Alpha. That changed quite dramatically the oil and gas offshore industry uh, and induced a step change in safety. It's where they really started taking safety seriously after that. Bunsfield, again, fairly recent. This is 2005. This is a vapor cloud explosion. And again, not far from where I was. Um, and it's a large storage of, in this case, aviation fuel. Uh, and we shouldn't be surprised at these because one of these goes up about somewhere in the world about every five years. Um, that they're usually in fairly remote locations uh, and not particularly well maintained. So why not put all your <laughs> aviation fuel in one place? 
Uh, that, I think, is Fukushima. Right, so what do we do about it? Well, if you're working on a high-risk building or any high-risk structure, we do this thing called FEMA or F-M-E-A, which is Failure Modes and Effect Analysis, which is a fancy engineering way of saying what's the worst that can happen. Uh, so for use in high hazard uh, situations such as oil rigs, gas rigs, uh, sports stadiums, nuclear power stations, chemical factories, petrochem installations and so on. Um, in the UK, these would be in the class three structures in New Zealand, they're probably in the class five uh, importance level five buildings uh, or structures as well. So what do you do? Well, you can't eliminate all risks. Uh, sorry to tell you, but there is no such thing as a risk free life. What you can do is assess the risks and then mitigate them to make them as low as reasonably practical. This is a, again expression from the nuclear and the petrochemical industries, a LARP, as low as reasonably practical. Um, to eliminate the more risks you eliminate, the more it costs. But then at some point you get to the law of diminishing returns where you're spending millions of dollars to save one life. Uh, and it's kind of why we have building regulations. Um, now, building regulations of some sort go way, way back. Uh, on the left is the Code of Hammurabi. Uh, which is in ancient Mesopotamia, which has a very simple law that if you build a building and the building falls down and kills somebody, you will die. Um, harsh, but I think quite fair. I think we should reintroduce that kind of law here. The equivalent would be corporate manslaughter, which we now have in the UK, but uh, sadly few other countries. On the right hand side, you've got the Great Hampton Fire of London in 1666. This was uh, a great push to for building regulations, uh, particularly fire regulations, and what it entailed was fire separation uh, and moving kitchens away from main buildings and bakeries away from main buildings. Uh, as you may know, the Great Fire of London was started in a bakery. And there's a funny thing about flour that you can get a vapour cloud explosion and spontaneous ignition uh, from flour once it's airborne. So back to New Zealand, there is a building regulatory framework and they do this lovely triangle diagram. So at the top of the tree is the building egg, that's the law. Um, and from that we derive the building code, which interprets the building act as to what you're supposed to be doing. Um, so all our buildings in New Zealand are supposed to comply with the building code and its various subsections. To do that, there are compliance pathways so there are a number of compliance pathways, including predefined alternative solutions, verification methods and acceptable solutions. So if you go on the right hand side, the verification methods and acceptable solutions are published uh, through uh, MB as part of the building code. And those are already deemed to comply, as it were. If you want an alternative design, then you need to demonstrate that it complies with the building code. And then underneath is general guidance uh, issued by various bodies, technical bodies uh, in New Zealand. The primary one in New Zealand will be brands, and there's lots of guidance from them, primarily on housing, but also other buildings as well. So the, the, the thrust of a lot of regulations, or it should be certainly in the UK, is robustness. Make your building robust. And uh, what do we mean by that? Well, you need structural redundancy. Uh, in your building and so you put more elements in that you need um, and you make them robust enough so that they're strong and ductile to absorb a high amount of energy and they deform under extreme loads so we want ductile elements not brittle elements brittle elements will collapse suddenly uh, partnered with that are alternative load paths so <clears throat> You can make alternative load paths by making the connection stronger than they would be normally. So there's minimum tie forces. There's many of the codes around the world, so in the UK, Europe and New Zealand, define minimum connection loads that your, your connections need to be uh, provided for. 
so it's not sufficient, as you say, merely to tie structural elements together. You've got to find what the load path is and provide that load path. And if the primary load path is removed, for whatever reason, um, is there an alternative? So, what are these alternative load paths? So we're relying on other things, other structural mechanisms um, to redistribute loads. So once something's failed, we need the load to go down somewhere else. And to do that, um, we mobilize a number of behaviors. One of them could be catenary action in the structural frame. So instead of your beam acting as a bending member, it can act as a tie under catenary action, but the only way it can act as a catenary is if the connections are strong enough to do that, transmit the tensile forces. You've also got shear deformation of transfer structures uh, as well. That could be an alternative path. Membrane action in structural slabs. So if you've designed your structural slab simply for a vertical or gravity loads in there, uh, particularly if it's concrete, you can usually get some membrane action to take lateral loading and distribute the lateral loading to other uh, bracing members. Uh, Virendil action in beams and columns that are tied together. You could, I know you've got no, normally pinned connections, but you can get some moment out of those to turn these frames or these trusses into Virendil girders. Yeah, and floors can turn into arches. Um, and the, yeah, the thicker the floor, the better for this arching so that the the path can go down uh, to the supporting walls. So here's an example from BS5950 of how you tie your structure together. Um, so in, in this case, it's a, uh, a steel frame building. Uh, I think the diagram in Eurocode 3 is very similar, <laughs> probably because it's taken from 5950. Uh, and so wherever you've got uh, the primary elements um, connecting the columns, you make sure that those um, connections can carry the additional tensile forces. A reminder of what Euro codes are based on. Um, they're not just simple uh, cut and paste from the national codes. They, when they were derived, it was thought that they need to put out the founding assumptions. The first obvious thing is um, get somebody who knows what they're doing so that your system, your structural system, is designed by somebody who's qualified and experienced in that particular structural system. And uh, they are supervised and the quality control is provided during the design and during the execution of the work. I think more and more we're missing that supervision during execution of the work. Execution in Eurospeak is actually doing the work, um, actually construction. So ex execution, when you mean execution in Euro speak, it's doing the work, it's construction. Um, so the, the, the people on site need to have appropriate skills and experience. Don't just, just pick anybody to start laying bricks and blocks. Um, in Euro codes, they are used as specified in the Euro code, basically, are using the material as it should be using um, and in accordance with the relevant standard. And this is a biggie. The structure will be adequately maintained. So all buildings need maintenance. Um, some may need more than others. And if you design it right, um, you can minimise the amount of maintenance a structure needs, but it will still need maintenance. And that may be at 25 years or it may be at 50 years. Or in some cases for uh, buildings, it might be 10 years. Uh, as we spoke earlier in terms of our structural design process, uh, don't build in maintenance issues. And if something needs to be maintained, try to provide access uh, to it. And yeah, is the structure being used in accordance with the design assumptions? So often buildings have failed because they've been converted to another use. Um, that, for example, you know, housing could be turned into a nightclub. Um, and the nightclub loading is much uh, heavier and more vibrant uh, than um, the housing. And so they, the dance floor will collapse as well. 
So for your guidance, um, there are some guides from the Institution of Structural Engineers uh, in London. These two, I think, are still valid and still very useful. Um, so in October 2010, they brought out this, the guide to robustness and disproportional collapse in buildings. That gives out the basics. Um, and, and then when you're looking at, uh, in the UK, it's class three structures, or high risk structures, you're supposed to do a systematic risk assessment. And so what are the risks? How are you mitigating it? And, and so on for your building. Um, keep in touch with a thing called CROSS. CROSS is the Confidential Reporting on Structural Safety. Uh, which came out of the Standing Committee on Structural Safety. Uh, and this allows engineers and um, building control authorities and building consent authorities to raise concerns about the designs they've seen uh, and particularly failures or near misses. Uh, it started in the UK, but there's now an Australian version. So this is across us. Um, and if you sign up to it, it'll send you the, their newsletter, I think just about every month or two months as well. And they're interesting, interesting reading uh, as well. So that's the end of this seminar. The, the next seminar in a couple of weeks time, uh, we're looking at structural inspection. Now, the long word is inspection and appraisal of existing and new structures. So we're going to go through the procedure. How do you do it? And the underlying question that's always coming along when you're commissioned to do a structural inspection is how safe is my building? So see you next time.